This week on TGC News, gun parts galore, new guns, and I'm tackling more of your questions than ever before. Kinetic Development Group is the place to outfit your FN SCAR rifle. Bottom to top and front to back, they have everything you could need. The SAS stock set, the MREX rail, QD points everywhere, and of course, the scarging handle. Top it off with some Kinect or side lock mounts, and you've got yourself a next level setup in a hurry. And then you can pack it all into the apparition bag and be on your way. We've worked with KDG since the early days of TGC, and you guys know the drill. Go to kineticdg.com, use the code TGC10 to get 10% off your entire order. Welcome back to another episode of TGC News, the only gun news show that covers things you actually care about. My name is John Patton, and boys and girls, I'm a little bit under the weather, so forgive me if I sound a bit weird this week. Oh my god, you're dying? Uh-oh. <laughs> This episode is going to be a little bit different. We are going to plow through our regular stories and then spend some time taking even more of your questions. But first, there's a link at the top of the description of this video that will take you to the TGC affiliate link database. There's some discount codes for some brands. Otherwise, it's just links that help us. If you are shopping online, please Use those links to help us out. Now, let's jump into the news. First up is a new line of optics from a company that previously was best known for pistol-mounted lasers. I'm not talking about Crimson Trace. Viridian has been around for a long time, and it seems to be a trend these days to call up a Chinese factory and slap a label on somebody else's optic. I'm not positive if that's where this is going, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. Either way, more optics is certainly not a bad thing. On launch, they have three different lines, a sort of good, better, best scenario. The bottom end of the pricing scale is the Eon line, and those are selling right now for a, a hair shy of 50 bucks. Certainly not expensive. The step up from there is the Venta line, and those start around 200 bucks. And then there's the Seric line, which seems to be a sort of longer range optic, but is also going for 200 bucks right now. I was sort of expecting them to go after the likes of Crimson Trace because they just started selling optics not that long ago. And it seems like they decided to go after the crappy True Glow optics instead. I'll be really curious to see how this goes for Viridian in the coming months. Next up this week, X-Tech Tactical, a company best known for shaking up the AK magazine game, has introduced something that HK should have introduced. 17 and 21 round mags for the VP9. While that doesn't seem like something that's crazy, oh my god, more rounds, just like a little bit more. <laughs> it's surprising that no one has chased down this aftermarket VP9 mag besides x -Tech. Like, as far as I know, nobody else is making aftermarket mags. For reference, the VP9 ships with 15 round mags. HK sells 20 round mags aftermarket. x -Tech has managed to fit 17 rounds into a mag that is just a hair larger than the 15 rounders, and the extended mag is just sort of a one-up thing. To me, having more rounds in a very similar size is always going to be a good thing. They are 35 bucks for the 17 and 50 for the Extendos. Also in the news this week, Henry has expanded their lineup of side gate lever actions. That's where you load from the side instead of down the tube like they normally do. Otherwise known as the finally guns to include a new 4570 version as well as a 410 shotgun version. For me, these open up the possibility of being threaded and suppressed since you aren't required to use the tube and that you don't have to like pull that out the front and then hit the suppressor, take the suppressor off, all that kind of nonsense. You don't have to do that with the side gate loading. That is enough for me to pay attention. Pricing on these starts at 1045 bucks, which for a nice lever action is not super uncommon. Next up this week, a company called Deadfoot Arms has released a new version of their side folding adapter for ARs. It operates on something they call the MCS, or Modified Cycling System, and using a modified bolt carrier, the gun is able to cycle with just a little bump out the back. It's kind of a short little nub that sticks out the back. 
all while the stock remains folded around. It's also angled slightly down when it folds so that you can still access the forward assist if you feel the need and so that the brass can clear it. The Gen 2 version has some small but important updates. First off, it's lighter. It's also stronger, and when folded, it stays tighter to the gun, like closer to the gun. Certainly not things that I'd be okay with leaving out of the feature set myself. Pricing on these weighs in at $420 bucks for the rifle caliber kit and $450 for the pistol caliber kit. In Struggle Bus news... Ruger announced in their third quarter earnings statement that they are down nearly $20 million versus the same time frame last year. On top of that, they're down almost $69 million for the running year total versus last year. It's hard to point to a single issue that could cause something like this. You know, maybe they didn't come out with enough cool guns and maybe the economy is weird and maybe people just aren't buying guns because there's not that much pressure this year. But I'll tell you what, it's very telling that a big boy like Ruger is down that much. I guess the Trump slump continues. Also, a former struggle bus rider that may have stepped off the bus. Adam's Arms ran into some trouble earlier this year, and the entire company went up for sale, like all of it. They announced recently that they are back up and running under new leadership with a new facility and some new products. There's no telling if this shakeup will be a positive thing for the company or if it's really going to hurt them in the long run. But I, for one, am looking forward to seeing what they can come up with as time progresses. And now, as you guys always request, Patton's Armory. This is a segment where I grab one of my personal guns and tell you about it. This bad boy right here is a 1932 Nagant revolver. Now, you guys know that I'm not super huge into mill serps. This is one of the very few that I'm like really jazzed about. The thing that makes this special is it's what's called a gas seal revolver. The cylinder that holds the rounds actually moves forward to seal around the forcing cone at the back end of the barrel. What that means is all of the gas is closed in and used to propel the projectile forward. What that also means is because there's not gas coming out the side and no sound, therefore, with that exploding gas, that means everything's going down the barrel, which also means that you can thread this and suppress it. Yes, you can suppress. This is, as far as I know, the only revolver that is legitimately able to be suppressed. So I bought one of these. It's cool. It's in decent shape. It's got like these old school. I mean, this is the definition of old. It's a 1932 and I really enjoy it. I mean, here, I'll, I'll cock back the hammer so you guys can see. It's got the firing pin right on the hammer. This is legit cool and I'm really excited about it. So there it is, my Nagant revolver, Patton's Armory. If you guys want to see more of my guns, let me know down in the comments. Have you ever tried to put a gun together with this or these? Or maybe this? Or maybe even this? <laughs> Maybe it's time to consider getting some schooling from Sonoran Desert Institute. SDI offers courses from some of the best and brightest the gun industry has to offer. From gunsmithing to reloading to full-on associate's degrees in firearms technology, you can learn all of that from the comfort of your own home. To learn more, head over to sdi.edu. It's time for more Friendly Fire, the segment where I answer your questions from all over the internet. This time, our questions are coming from the TGC Nation Facebook group. I asked for your questions, and of course, you guys delivered. First up, Emmett Ozuna says, how do we get gun and gear companies and gun tubers to more proactively advocate for 2A rights? Well, it's tough for gun companies. If they open their mouths, and I want them to, I really want them to be like, no more, we're not taking this crap and they say the wrong thing, they're screwed in the enthusiast community. Look at what happened to Springfield Armory as an example of that. No matter what they say, people are going to pick it apart. Imagine, imagine if a gun company came out and said, we don't support any new legislation. People will attack them for using the word new. Expecting big companies, big gun companies to jump on board with the boogaloo is being short-sighted. As far as gun tubers go, I'll tell you what, doesn't work. Demanding that they do things. Sending giant walls of text. Being a jerk when they don't respond to your messages right away. That stuff happens to me 
all the time, and it makes me not want to help folks that do that. Gun tubers with a decent audience are generally busy. They're small. I've talked about this. They're small outfits. They're busy. They're usually one or two people at most. If you want their help, make it easy for them to help you. Just saying things like, please help us is not enough. The easier you can make it for people to help you and help you accomplish your goals, the more likely they're going to be to do it. I don't know. That's that's not great. You probably don't feel really good about hearing that. But in reality, gun tubers are being hammered from all over the country. All of these areas that have bad legislation going on, every single one of those areas has people asking the gun tubers for help. And it's not always easy to just go and do nothing but advocacy work. And I know that's probably not what you wanted to hear, and it's not great, but advocacy is a challenging thing when people are getting hammered from every corner of the country right now. There's so much bad legislation going on. Gun tubers are small teams, and spreading themselves really, really thin is a dangerous proposition. Josh Wesker wants to know my thoughts on full auto concealed carry. Let's assume that you decided to carry a Glock 18 machine pistol. That gun is worth a significant amount of money. Not only that, but if you ever had to use that, imagine the legal like tidal wave that would be sent your way because you defended yourself with a machine gun. Now consider if any of those rounds missed. Can you carry a full auto? Sure. Should you? Probably not. That's a big, big time risk if anything goes sideways. Sean Harold says... What can we do to get gun owners to understand that no one is fighting for them and they need to help themselves? Honestly, that's a battle that I'm fighting all the time, trying to get people enthusiastic about helping themselves because, you know, there are no groups or organizations that are going to fight for everybody all the time, forever, always. We need to be representative of ourselves. We need people to step up in every single state in the nation and push in the same direction. Again, Making it easy for people to help will get folks off their butts. Ryan Bell says, do you feel that some commonality between your guns is important? I assume that means in terms of like caliber and magazines. I guess, I guess that's what that means. And the answer is absolutely not. I am way past the point of being practical with the guns that I own. The things that matter to me are like the cool factor, the rarity, and if I enjoy shooting it. Ryan Isidore says... If you could own any firearm that you don't currently have, what is it and why? My top three. A Barrett M82A1, a Dillon minigun, and an FG42. The Barrett is one of the coolest, like, most visceral shooting experiences that I've ever had. I really enjoy that. The minigun is just a jaw dropper for so many reasons. And the FG42 is super rare and flat out cool. John Villafania Jr. says, what is your biggest pet peeve with movie guns? Honestly, the thing that gets me is not like, oh, there's too many rounds in that mag. That's nonsense. That guy didn't reload. Like those things, yeah, they're, they're annoying, but that's not my biggest pet peeve. That super jerky, fast-paced crap that everybody is doing now in fight scenes and shootout scenes, that's my biggest pet peeve. Other than that, I don't care. I know it's a movie. I know the accuracy of depiction. That's not their main goal. They're there to make a cool movie. Jason Osborne says, what can we do to bridge the gap between modern sporting rifle people and the older sort of hunting rifle guys? Honestly, the key is to let them shoot the newer guns. Some might like it, some might not, but the key is to let them try it and hopefully they enjoy it. My friendly fire question to you guys this week. Why do you feel like we are losing in the gun rights battle? Why do you think that is currently happening? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this one. Sound off in the comments below. And if you want to ask a friendly fire question, send that to me over on theguncollective.com. And that is it for this week's show, guys. If you didn't like it, hit that button. If you liked it, hit like, get subscribed, and consider supporting us via the links in the video description. We would greatly appreciate that. And as always, thank you all for watching. We'll see you soon. Welcome back to another episode of It's Not Scrolling. What's that? Welcome back to an episode of It's Not Scrolling. And guys, that is it for this week's show. If you enjoyed it, hit that button. If you didn't, hit it. Let me do that one more time. <laughs> yep, it's over. But don't worry, you can click on the video up top to watch last week's show. And the one below that is the one that YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. Check them out and let me know what you think.